All right. Good evening, everybody. It's Steve with Real Progressives. We're going to have a good show tonight. You know, for some of you who don't know this, last night I had a scare of a lifetime. I uh, got lightheaded. Uh, my vision was blurry. Uh, my chest felt tight. I couldn't swallow well. Um, was incoherent, quite frankly, felt lethargic. My arms felt like they were a thousand pounds. Um, <clears throat> It was very, very frightening, and uh, we weren't sure if I, you know, had heart problems going on or whether I was having a stroke or something. Uh, so I fought off the urge to not go to the doctor. Uh, went to the urgent care center, the uh, the symptoms, and said, "Mr. Grumbine, please get your butt over there to the ER." So I spent the night in the ER where they did a series of tests, had a really, really cool uh, nurse that walked me through a bunch of different things, great doctors. Um, they really, really paid attention. They got me right in. They didn't screw around. Um, and it turned out, of course, which is good, not to be a heart attack or, uh, you know, a um, an aneurysm or a stroke or anything like that turned out to be something that I had no idea of, which is a hypothyroid. And um, it didn't seem like it was that big a deal. But then they gave me the stats, and forgive me for not knowing all the medical terminology. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I talk economics, I don't talk medicine. Um, but the, uh, the issue came down to that uh, my numbers that you would normally have people, regular people that have a good functioning thyroid system are at a five, whatever that means. My number was at a 32. And uh, the guy told me, he goes, have you experienced any weight gain lately? And I looked down and did the truffle shuffle. And I said, yes, sir, I have. And, uh, and then he started talking to me about my energy levels. And for those of you who have seen my live streams, you know, it appears that I'm like wired for sound and I am. But I was very, very, very low on energy for myself, which just doesn't feel good because I thrive on my energy. And uh, it was just really bad. And uh, anyway, long story short, they gave me some medicine. Um, I'm going to do some more research, going to go talk to my regular doctor, going to find out what we can do uh, to change it. But I put on almost 70 pounds in the last two years. And uh, yesterday, with stress from various things going on in my private life, coupled with real progressives world, I, um, you know, it, the stress just finally took me down and uh, I ended up having to get some help. So for those of you out there who are afraid to go to the doctor and afraid that uh, it's going to turn out to be nothing, um, you know, I know we've got some differences of opinion about Western medicine and Eastern medicine and vegan living and so forth. But I just want to tell you though, point blank, regardless, it is worth getting checked out. Don't waste time. It could have been a real problem. Um, they did the CT scan with the dye and, and whatnot. And the good news is, is that I don't have any blockages. I don't have anything. It was a very, very, very encouraging visit. So for those of you out there, I, I really, really, really recommend taking care of it. But that brings me to another point and that's the topic of tonight. So we've got a hurricane going on, a real nasty situation down in the south, um, you know, in the center of, uh, you know, quite frankly, in a, in a very, very conservative area uh, where people don't tend to think real highly of helping, uh, you know, having the government help out like in New Jersey or other places. Um, they've even voted to cut spending on FEMA, which is disaster recovery and so forth. And, you know, the the jerk in the uh, spirit could say to uh, be a jerk about this and revel in it. The reality is, is that I don't care how stupid they vote or how stupid their sensibilities are. They're human beings. Let me tell you something. I have children that live in Texas and I don't want to see them harmed either. Um, so I would never wish ill on anyone. So I hope there's no one out there that's celebrating um, you know, people, people suffering. That's, I don't find there to be any merit in that, any validity in that. 
Um, so I really, really hope to God people take a step back and just consider as human beings, um, you know, what's going on down there. But, you know, when it comes to these things, I find it fascinating that we always rush to the GoFundMe Kickstarters. Hey, everybody donate to the cause kind of thing. Do, do we live in like Ecuador or, or friggin Zimbabwe or, or, you know, Antarctica? No. We live in the United States of America, whether you think that we're a inverted totalitarian state or whether you're still sipping the American dream Kool-Aid. Bottom line is our country can afford without borrowing money from a bunch of friggin billionaires to make them feel like gods. We can afford to pay for any kind of disaster relief we need to do down there. And it, I find it fascinating that we allow ourselves to deify the wealthy who contribute these big donations to help these things. Don't get me wrong. Hey, that's great. I appreciate anybody that has a heart for this stuff, but let's, let's make it real clear. The idea of waiting for donations to help the poor is ridiculous. We all know that as much as it's nice to talk about charity, charity is really a result of the government not doing its job. And when you look at, the disaster recovery in, say, uh, you know, in New Jersey, or now what will end up happening in Katrina and what happened now in Houston, you've got to consider our federal government should be able to pay for this without batting an eye. We shouldn't even be discussing how we're going to pay for it. This stuff should be so basic, so fundamental to what it is to be just a citizen in this nation to know the bottom line of the disaster hits our government's got our back. It's got a charge to protect the welfare, the public welfare, our welfare, okay? It has that charge. It should be a simple no-brainer. And yet here we are looking at these wealthy individuals donating 40 million, 4 million, 3 million, 50,000, 100,000. And at the end of the day, it really is kind of silly, isn't it? You wouldn't want food stamps and stuff like that to be dependent on whether churches felt the people that were getting them were deserving of those donations. You wouldn't want to risk chance as to whether or not these people deserve to be made whole. You wouldn't want to risk a profit motive for the insurance companies to make these people whole. You wouldn't want to see that anywhere, I wouldn't think, whether it be some bastion of liberalism and progressivism like Seattle or whether it would be some teabagger state like Texas, okay? Bottom line is, is that we want to save lives. They don't have to be good people to save their life. We want to save lives in general. So again, I come back to the question, why wouldn't our federal government simply just do it? Why do we sit there and wring our hands about where are we going to get the money to pay for these things? Because we don't understand these most basic and fundamental things. So because the people don't demand that the government spend on it, we sit there and have these debates. Some people have even gone to the trouble of lying to me and telling me that these discussions are irrelevant. The fact is, is that when the people stand up and demand action, action is taken. And the fact is, is that the people are so divided. They're so broken in part into little tiny factions of, you know, ridiculous beliefs that nobody can just basically understand the human life and life in general. There's animals down there. There's all sorts of stuff going on down there. The, the elderly, the poor, you name it. And this shouldn't even be a discussion. And yet here we are, people talking about, we got to go ahead and raise funds. We got to donate to the cause. You know, if I were the federal government, just like going ahead and, uh, using eminent domain to take away somebody's land for a pipeline, I would go down there to Joel Osteen's church and I'd say, yo, Joel, guess what, brother? You will be housing anybody that requires housing. Oh, you don't like that. I'm sorry, but you will. These are the things that when our federal government doesn't step in and act boldly to save lives and to mitigate suffering, it has completely failed us. But I promise you this, 
our government fails us nine times out of 10 because citizens do not own their power. They allow defeatists to turn them into do nothing couch potatoes. When in reality is that we as a nation have more power amongst our citizenry than we will ever know. You see a million people take into the street asking for these things, writing to your congressman. Everything doesn't have to be a fill the streets moment. But if everybody understood this, it'd be done. It'd be done. There wouldn't be any question whatsoever. So why do you suppose we deify the rich? Why do you suppose we elevate the rich as the saviors of our planet, of the saviors of these disasters, that we somehow or another think that we've got to pluck money off the rich because we think somehow or another that they are gods and they can serve us. They'll, they'll save us from ourselves. Folks, if we don't begin to understand this, lives are going to be lost all over the place. You know, one of the reasons why I'm going to go back to my story from last night. One of the reasons why I resisted going to the doctor for so long is because I don't have the money. I don't have the money. And when you look, you realize many other people don't go to the doctors because they don't have the money. And when they don't go to the doctors, guess what happens? Your teeth start rotting out. You start getting clogged arteries. You start getting colon problems. You start getting all kinds of problems. The reality is, is that we the people deserve health care as a right, just like we deserve disaster protection as a right, just like we deserve a completely renewed infrastructure to rebuild America for all, to do away with poverty once and for all, to save the suffering. We can do this, and yet we sit on the sidelines believing it's all impossible. I've had people tell me that this, this is great, Steve. I love what you're saying, but, but we don't have a good democracy anymore. It, it doesn't work, so we're all going to die. And it's not a joke. That's literally the mindset. For me, I have tried my best to lay out a strategy for attacking these problems. Because we shouldn't have to have a disaster to bring us to the point of recognizing how important government spending is to make things happen. But here we are again, another disaster, another, hey, we gotta get donations together. And you know what? Again, as much as I wanna blame the government, as much as I wanna blame, the, blame these corporate uh, you know, tyrants and blame these bought off politicians and blame rigged elections and blame all these other things and blame the mainstream media. We gotta look within, we gotta look within. When I see people unwilling to talk economics, I know that the road to fixing these problems is insanely steep. It's not undoable, but it's just steep. And when I see people debate, debate semantic points, not getting the primary purpose, which is the government is supposed to be there to serve we the people, by the people, for the people. It doesn't mean that it is that. It means that we've stopped demanding it. We've stopped demanding it. We have rolled over and allowed them without a single whimper a meaningful whimper. We've allowed them to take away our nation from us. We've allowed them to co-opt it without any real struggle. And one by one by one, when I talk to people, they're defeated. They've already got their built-in progressive give up strategy and they say it's impossible. And then they start throwing up all the roadblocks and reasons why it's not possible. Now imagine how many people thought that Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and some of these other guys that were real entrepreneurs, how they 
were deemed impossible. It's never going to happen. Oh, pfft. it's never going to happen. Right? Now, I'm not here to laud these guys because these guys are, they got a lot of blood on their hands, in my opinion, right? But I am here to say that every time somebody says something's impossible, somebody proves it wrong. Hey, you're never going to get that airplane in the air oracle, right? Hey, you're never going to get that phone to ring Alexander Graham Bell. Hey, you're never going to stop crib death, Mr. Semmelweis, by washing hands. Ha ha ha. You think that we're going to stop all this birthing death by just washing our hands with bleach? You think that keeping cadaverous particles from a woman's uterus will stop this? Ha 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 ha. And that, my friends, is a typical, typical progressive give up strategy, even to this day. Even to this day, we fail to grasp the greatness of our own ideas. We fail to grasp that our ideas, as much as we love them, they really can happen. I think there's a lot of people on the left that are so used to losing, so used to not getting anywhere that they've gotten the cynicism about them that is so ridiculously corrosive to our movement that we stop really trying anything meaningful and we just go to burn it down. We go from zero to cut you in like that much time. And as you watch the video footage of the flooding in Houston and you watch the people looking for shelter and you watch this stuff unfold before your eyes, you think back to when Katrina happened and friggin' morgues and bodies floating down the roadway. And you think about levees busting. And we always get stuck every single time on the question, how are you going to pay for it? Every single time. Nothing could be more relevant to our society. Now, some people have asked, why doesn't Congress do this? If this is the truth, why doesn't Congress know about it? Why doesn't Congress do something? It's an interesting circular question. It kind of goes back and forth like a ping pong ball. You and I, if we're not enlightened, if we are not logical, if we don't do our homework, you and I probably only know economics from a standpoint of our household budgets. You and I probably look at our checkbook, write a check, see the number on the side, say, oh, we can't eat any food until the next check comes in. We're not currency issuers. Our federal government has control. It created the dollar out of thin air with the laws of the land. It created the Federal Reserve with the laws of the land. It created the Treasury with the laws of the land. And ultimately, it has complete control over the U.S. dollar. When the government says it needs to spend, Federal Reserve keystrokes, a.k.a. makes deposits into the Treasury's bank accounts out of thin air. And out of thin air, the government, which was spending based on congressional edict, brings new money forth. We don't dig it out of the ground. We don't go catching it in the ocean. We don't get it from petro dollars. We don't get it from frigging gold bullion. We get it based on the full faith and credit of the United States and based on the fact that we tax in the government's unit of account, the U.S. dollar. This is so simple, a caveman should be able to get it. And yet we sit there and say, no, no, no. No, it's not possible. It's a cult. It's a cult. It's wrong. No way. It's just simple truth. It's just simple truth. And you know what? You may not like the people in Texas. You may think that they're bad people. But what happens when a progressive city gets struck? What's your excuse going to be then? Hey, we got to hit the donation button, guys. Got to get our donations in. It's really time. It's beyond time 
for progressives to stop with the old tired belief that we got to raise taxes to fund spending. It's a lie. It's been a lie forever. Beardsley Rummel, the former Fed chair from New York Fed, said point blank, taxes for revenue are obsolete. 1946, that was still gold standard era. 1971, Richard Nixon removed us from the gold standard, giving us a sovereign, free-floating, meaning it's not pegged to any commodity, non-convertible, meaning you can't convert it to gold, fiat currency, which is backed by taxation. You cannot pay your taxes in gold bullion. You cannot pay your taxes in barrels of petrodollars. You cannot pay your taxes in Bitcoin. You have to convert your Bitcoins to U.S. dollars to pay your taxes. Why is that? It's not because the government needs revenue. It should be called something other than the IRS. It should be called the Inflation Prevention Service Center or something like that. But taxes most definitely don't pay for a single thing. They're deleted upon receipt. So if taxes are deleted upon receipt and every other dollar out the door is a new dollar, we're printing money every single time the government spends, although it's not printing at all. The Treasury prints, the Bureau of Engraving prints and mints. Everything else is keystroke dollars on a computer, in a spreadsheet, and that's it. That's it. Talking with Tim Canova the other day, he said, you know what? Taxes don't fund spending. He said the government is not fiscally constrained. Is Tim an MM tier? He's damn close. He's close enough that I'd support him. And let me tell you something. I don't think Tim's a member of any cult. Tim's a pretty damn good guy. Tim's taking on Debbie What's-Her-Name Schultz. We need to get behind a guy like Tim. But Tim gets it. Close enough anyway. But you know what? All politicians are held to your and my expectation. If you and I think that the government should be run like our household budget, like a bunch of Republicans do, like a bunch of ANCAPs do, like a bunch of libertarians do, like a bunch of freaking Democrats do even. If you think for a minute that the federal government, the creator of the U.S. dollar, needs our tax dollar to spend, you might be a neoliberal and you don't even know it. But neoliberals believe that the government is constrained, that it requires our tax dollars to fund itself. It's kind of silly, actually, when you think about it. But that's what we do. And that's what politicians will continue to do until the people rise up and say no more. They're not going to be the one that tells you the truth. Guys, they got to get reelected. Look at how many deniers exist now. Look at regular people who don't take the time to learn, who fancy themselves smart, make little sideways smiles. <laughs> tell you about something that they don't know about. This right here, my friends, is a curse of the 99%. The 99% have duped themselves, have trapped themselves, have put themselves in a barrel of disbelief and of absolute belief that the government is somehow or another steeped in debt and is incapable of taking care of us. Or in the case of Houston right now with Harvey. We need to go ahead and raise funds from the people because the government is too broke to take care of this in spades. I'm telling you, when you think about it, you're going to see them right. You're going to see them right. It's not a cult. I assure you that it's a, if it is a cult, it's a cult of being awesomely smart and on point and getting it and wanting to save lives. If you want to say that I'm a part of a cult, I'll take that as long as it's a cult of saving lives. 
I think it's really important that we all recognize what the neoliberals did to us Bernie supporters back in the day, even you ex-Bernie supporters. Anybody remember being called the cult of Bernie? Anybody remember the Hillbots calling us Bernie bots or Bernie bros or any of the other things that they used to dismiss and demean us so that we were somehow or another marginalized and our words and our voices didn't matter? Do you remember that? I do. I still got PTSD from people gaslighting and marginalizing and calling us a cult as Bernie supporters back in the day or Jill supporters. The Green Party is a bunch of cultists. It's a demeaning, dehumanizing way of cutting the legs out from under people that are fighting for a given cause, whatever that cause might be. It's shameful. It's wrong. And it literally leads people astray. Now, I want it to be known. I know you already know this, but for those who may not know this, I didn't create MMT, which is modern monetary theory. I didn't. It's been around a lot longer than I ever knew about it. A lot of really, really, really smart people did, though, because nobody bothered to think about what the ramifications were for the United States once Nixon took us off the gold standard. Nobody took the time to understand what Nixon was talking about, what happened. Sadly, we saw Ronald Reagan use MMT, if you will for the purposes of the military industrial complex. MMT is not something to be implemented. MMT is a description of the way the federal finance or really currency works anywhere in the world. But in the case of the United States, it describes our current system from 1971 to present. So when people don't understand that when you tell me about 1913, doesn't really matter. It's not the same thing. It's irrelevant, really, largely. When you tell me about some other point in time in history from before, well, back in 18 something, I don't care. Means nothing to me. I could care less. And trust me, I'm a student. I get it. I learned that stuff too. Doesn't have any pertinence. Zero pertinence. It's a sidelining thing to say. Now, MMT is the only school that took from 1971 to present and figured it out. The textbooks haven't caught up yet. We're still talking neoliberal nonsense. Most of it is Milton Friedman crap, right wing Milton Friedman. Now, just because Ron Paul would do away with FEMA, just because some of these other people in the alt-right, center-right, liberal-right, the friggin' Alex Jones crew, just because they don't understand this stuff doesn't mean you have to not understand it. In 1971, something changed. And unfortunately, the only people that figured it out were the right-wingers. And they have used our fear of debt deficits and inflation to keep all of us in a box while they spend like drunken whores on wars around the world. There's never a shortage of dollars when we want to go to war. Not one minute do you ever sweat. Hey, guys, we're going to go broke. There's going to be hyperinflation if we drop another bomb. You never hear that. Why do you suppose that is? Can you answer that question? If not, there's a problem. Have you ever noticed that when we talk about something as minuscule as health care for all, much less Medicare for all, we're instantly met with inflation, hyperinflation. What are you going to do? Just print more money? Straight out of right wing Milton Friedman's playbook. That's not a progressive thought. That's bullshit debunked economics. Bullshit debunked economics. So why would progressives that have these bold ideas want a new deal, want free college for all, want to get rid of student loans, want to eradicate student debt, want green energy, want infrastructure to prevent levees from breaking like they did in Louisiana? Why would they say right-wing economic bullshit? Anybody 
Want to chance that one? I can't fathom it. It makes no sense to me. When you think about it and you do the math, the closest thing I've got is Bernie Sanders' plan from back during the primaries. Have no idea if he still supports it, don't care. He was offering up $33 trillion in new spending with only 19 trillion in new taxes. That's a pretty big deficit, would you agree? People are like, how are you gonna pay for it? That's all he heard over and over, the, the media mocked him. But we knew, his chief economic advisor, Stephanie Kelton, she knew. The people, how are you gonna pay for it? Wall Street speculation tax. Wall Street speculation tax is what we call a Pagovian tax. Pagovian tax is something that is not good for society. It's not good for humanity. It's not good for the markets. We want to change said behavior. So we put a Pagovian tax on a behavior we don't like. Like maybe we want to stop people from driving their cars around. So we put a big, huge tax on gasoline. Or maybe we don't want people to smoke. So we put a big, huge tax on cigarettes. Or maybe we don't want them to, uh, I don't know, trade, day trading, high speed trading, whatever. Maybe we want to stop risky investments on Wall Street. So we put a big, huge tax on it. Or even a marginal tax on it. What happens when the behavior stops? Anybody? The revenue shrinks. It doesn't really matter because the revenue wasn't revenue to begin with because federal taxes are deleted upon receipt. But regardless, those tax receipts shrink because it's a behavior modification tax. So if you're funding major programs with behavior modification taxes, think about it for a minute. It doesn't require an economic mind. It doesn't even require a terribly logical mind, just an awake mind. The revenue shrinks. You prove that the friggin' programs are self-sustaining. That's the way it goes. So when we look at Harvey and we look at the destruction of our southern coast. We shouldn't even be flinching. We should just already know government's going to pay for it. We might volunteer to help people with our bodies, with our efforts to save lives. But as for the costs of any rebuild or the costs for life-saving measures, that should be the easiest thing for us to take care of. And yet, here we are, progressives still pretending that macroeconomic reality is a boogeyman. So when I say people that fight against MMT are murderers by proxy, by proxy means something else is doing it, but their actions by signing on to ignorance about austerity or ignorance about economics, no matter how innocent the purpose behind it, you leave blood on your own hands when you support that. That's why we call people murderers by proxy. Not because we're trying to hurt your feelings. We just want you to see the cause and effect of austerity. We want you to understand that your behavior in denying macroeconomic reality has a life cost on the other end of your denial. It's not a cult. Math is not a cult. Accounting is not a cult. And truth is not a cult. If you don't understand, say you don't understand. There's nothing shameful in that. But if you demean, if you demonstrably kick the legs out from under people fighting to save lives. You've got blood on your hands. You are a murderer by proxy. 
I wish I could say differently, but it's true. So it's time for us, you and I, all progressives, if you want a new deal, you got to embrace the economics of truth that allows you to get a new deal. Instead of fighting, fighting, saving lives. What kind of person does that? Seriously, I don't even, I don't even get it. Think about it for a minute. You want to make the rich suffer? Let me tell you what makes the rich suffer. When they have everything, you giving them an extra 3% tax or 20% tax, it's not going to do anything to them. They'll find a way to get around it. What will do something to them is to make them irrelevant by spending without their blessing, by demanding it and making it so. By instituting a federal job guarantee to make sure every man, woman, and child that wants a job, of age child, mind you, that wants a job, is eligible for a federal job guarantee. They're eligible for a living wage. They're eligible for living benefits. And that will set the wage floor and that will eradicate poverty and it will allow people to serve the public purpose. And maybe be right there on the ground ready to help the people in Houston or the next disaster area. So next time someone says it's a cult, tell them, sorry, reality's no cult. I'm Steve Grumbine with Real Progressives. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks.